name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are thus. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us. And that his face may be known on earth, his salvation among all nations. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him.
Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, you sent your Son to gain and proclaim the forgiveness of sins for all people and to establish the holy ministry so that the good news might extend to all nations. Awaken in the hearts of many an eager longing to preach the gospel to others and move us to encourage and support them with our prayers and gifts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from Isaiah the prophet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, 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 
is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. The sound of their voices, the doorposts, and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. The word of the Lord. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble 
and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The word of the Lord. Oh, 
The Gospel reading is a lesson from the Gospel from St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. The Gospel of the Lord. Sure. 
This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We hear the word of God today from Psalm 145, beginning with verse 3. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all and has compassion on all he has made. All you have made will praise you, O Lord. Your saints will extol you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, fellow heirs of his promises. Come back onto this campus and the memories come flooding in and the stories can be told. I remember my very first week as a student on this campus as those very helpful seniors were leading the new students down the hill toward their first introductory and traditional dip in the lagoon. And Mrs. Lavrance, the wife of the school president and his secretary, decided to play along with the joke, came running out of the office saying, you can't take those boys down to the lagoon. They dredged that lagoon this summer and they found quicksand. I remember another story, sitting in a classroom where a professor who had just gone outside to have a smoke on his pipe came into the classroom and before long started smoking again, this time literally because he hadn't emptied the pipe out and it was in his pocket. If you attended this school, you can tell much more than just humorous stories. You can tell of those respected professors Men whose words you listened to, whose experiences you shared, whose wisdom you gained, and whose words of wisdom you found yourself ever since repeating, almost unconsciously, in sermons and Bible classes. If you attended this school, you would remember chapel worship, led by your nervous classmates and with that unforgettable singing. If you were a student here, you could tell of Christmas concerts, amazing Christmas concerts. You could tell of late night theological discussions in the dormitory. You could tell of incidents of the excitement of call day. And you could tell of those moments, those very special moments in a short three years on this campus that you spent digging into the scriptures that you spent seeing God's hand at work in history, that you spent studying the Lutheran confessions and making the confessions of Luther and the Reformers your own. Stories you could tell. And even if you weren't a student at this school, have never attended here, I'm sure you could tell of experiences that are directly related to it. I'm sure you can tell of that day of excitement when your son or grandson or brother was assigned to his first call as a pastor. I'm sure you could think of the day of excitement that you came to this school and met for the very first time that young man who was assigned to be your pastor in your congregation. I'm sure you would realize every week as you watch your pastor and listen to him preach his sermons and teach his Bible classes and visit the sick and the shut-in, you know deep down inside that this is a man who was trained, who was equipped, who was shaped and molded at this very school. Yes, we could tell a lot of stories. And even those of us who've had many experiences with, institution, with this institution could say much. But we couldn't begin to tell everything that has happened here by God's grace over the 150 years of this school's history. But if these walls could speak, 
Whether it's the walls of the school in Watertown or Wauwatosa or here in Mequon, what it is that they could tell, what a rich history that they could explore and explain. If these walls could speak, they could tell of everything that's happened here in these 150 years, of all of the blessings God has given, of all of the grace that he showered on us as a church body. If these walls could speak, they could remind us of why it is we're here today celebrating and what it is we have to be thankful for. If these walls could speak, what would they say? They would sing of a rich heritage to be treasured. They would tell of a confident hope to be embraced. And they would speak and echo with a precious message to be proclaimed. David said, great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. David had very good reason to sing. Plucked from the fields, surrounded by sheep, David now found himself sitting on a throne, ruling over a mighty kingdom. But David knew that he had much more to be thankful for to God than the fact that he was given political power and military success. He knew that God had given him an even more precious, a much more precious gift, that God himself had given him the promise of a savior, of heritage that was not just a gift to David, but a heritage that stretched back to the very beginning, a heritage that God gave to his people through generations from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the generations between them and David. A heritage that was made possible because God had made a promise that he was bound and determined to keep. A God who would work in history to see to it that in every step of the way he would be keeping that promise and ultimately it would be fulfilled. A God who would remind his people of that promise through words of the prophets again and again and again and who would illustrate the beauty of that promise through the sacrifices that would be performed. Sacrifices that would point to a lamb, great David's greater son, the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. No wonder David sang, one generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. If the walls of this seminary could speak, would they not sing also of a rich heritage? A heritage that has come to us by the same power and the same grace and, the, and spoken in the same word of God? A heritage that we have enjoyed and known for these past 150 years? It was the summer of 1861, June. Just two months earlier, the opening shots of the Civil War had been fired on Fort Sumter. A decade before that, the Wisconsin Synod had been formed, and now 10 or 11 years later, it had some real problems. The problems were this, that thousands of people had been streaming into the Midwest from Germany, bringing their faith and their love for the Lord with them, forming congregations. But this Synod had no seminary and the number of pastors coming from Germany or from out east were simply not enough in number. And other pastors who came were anything but faithful to the word of God. As President Wentland pointed out in his foreword in your bulletin, the people of the Wisconsin Synod, many of them were like sheep without a shepherd, and many who had a shepherd had shepherds who were not faithful. It was then that the second president of the Wisconsin Synod came with a very bold proposal. If this church body was going to have sufficient pastors to fill pulpits, and if it was going to have pastors who would remain true and faithful to God's word, it would need its own seminary. And so President John Bodding proposed just that. He brought it to the Synod Convention in 1861. He was received politely. His idea had some sympathy. But the convention said no. The next year, things had gotten even worse. And President Bodding came back again saying even more urgently, and this is what he said, we must dig a well in our country and in our synod that will supply the workers. If 
we expect to wait until we are well fixed financially, it will never materialize. Dear brothers and friends, let us draw up a plan for the establishment of an educational institution. This time, the convention said yes, sort of. No definite plans were made. But by the next year, things were different. God gave his people of the Wisconsin Synod the courage and the faith to make that fateful decision to start a seminary. And in the fall of 1863, that seminary was begun in a rented house in Watertown with one student and with one professor, with uncertain finances and a shaky future, but the seminary began. And in spite of those humble beginnings, in the years that followed, the 150 years that followed, God would bless that seminary. He would bless it with faithful teachers. He would bless it with a growing number of students, improving facilities, and with the love and support of the people of the entire synod. But God would bless that seminary with something even more important. It was no accident that at this seminary, every single person who graduates shares the same confession of faith, shares the same conviction to the Word of God as absolute truth, shares the same understanding of what the gospel is and what it means, shares the same commitment to carrying out the mission of the church. It is no accident that at this seminary, very smart and intelligent men who would be considered wise by any standards willingly for 150 years have set aside their own reason, their own thinking, and have exchanged it for something called the foolishness of the cross and have found their truth and their conviction in the simple gospel and good news of what Jesus did. It is no accident that at this seminary, the men who go out from here go out not with their own wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, preaching and proclaiming nothing other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's not by chance that this school has chosen, chosen not to be a school whose purpose is to create and to produce scholars and theologians and linguists, even though it does produce many of those, but whose purpose, whose sole purpose remains to train pastors, shepherds, people, men who will feed God's flock with the truth of his word. It was by no human desire or plan that for 150 years, this seminary has been a place where men who taught here and men who graduated from here were equipped by God to meet some incredible challenges that the world would throw at this little church body. It was here that those men were convinced to stand purely on the grace of God and on nothing else in the election controversy. It was here that men were trained to stand firmly on the Word of God when many other Christian churches were abandoning the Bible as His inspired and inerrant Word. It was here in this place that men were taught for 150 years not to just be comfortable with the old doctrinal statements of the fathers, but to rediscover God's truth in the scriptures for their own and to take it to heart and to make it theirs. It was no accident that here at this seminary, those who taught and graduated from this place were men who stood firm on the truth that real fellowship, God-pleasing fellowship in God's church is based on one thing only, and that's on a shared conviction and belief of the doctrines of Scripture. Through the decades, it was here that God taught and trained men, standing firmly on the power of His Word, to recognize that God builds His church and changes souls in one way only, by the power of His means of grace. It's been said that as a seminary goes, so goes a synod. 
What a heritage we have to treasure. If these walls could speak, they would point to that heritage. A heritage where not only God has kept this seminary true and faithful, but through what it's done has given us the privilege of being in a church body that still has God's truth, that still stands firmly on His Word, that still believes God when He says, Thus I have spoken. It's that heritage that God has given us in this place. And with that heritage, he's given us something else, something even more personal. If the walls of this seminary could speak, they would tell. They would tell us of something that only God could give us. They could tell us of a hope, a sure and confident hope that each one of us can embrace by faith. David pointed to the reason for the hope that he had when he said, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he's made. An ordinary man who was made king, an undeserving man who was chosen to be in the line of the Savior, and a sinful man. A man who was a liar, an adulterer, and a murderer. A man who realized that God himself spoke to him through the prophet. It was God's hand pointing at him to remind him that he was the man, he was the sinner, he was the one who earned God's eternal death and damnation. And yet this was a man who also knew where his hope was found in the grace and mercy and compassion of a loving God who not only pointed, pointed at him the accusation of sin, but then pointed him to his promises and his mercy. At this seminary, for 150 years, sinful human beings just like David have heard the fierce message of God's law and have been exposed by that law for what they are, nothing but poor, miserable sinners. And just like David, they've found peace and comfort and hope in the only place it can be found, at the foot of our Savior's cross, in the assurance of God's full and free forgiveness, in the promises that he gives to his people. It's a heritage that has continued at this seminary for 150 years, but it's gone out from here and it's touched each one of us. It's a hope that you and I can embrace. Because at the end of another day, we've stood where David stood. We've stood where the people on this campus have stood. At the end of another day, God's law stares us fiercely in the face with its accusations. At the end of another day, our shoulders are burdened, burdened with the guilt of people who once again fallen far short of what God expects of us. At the end of another day, God's law drives us to our knees where we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But then he comes with that message of hope. Hope that has lived in every class of this school, been proclaimed in every chapel service at this school, been proclaimed by every pastor who's gone out from this school until it reached our ears and our hearts. So that you and I now know, by this proclamation of the good news that you and I have heard, that we can find true hope in faith at the foot of our Savior's cross that that hope can express true joy at the open doors of an empty tomb. That it's a hope that comes from you and me hearing God say to each one of us, my son, my daughter, be filled with joy. Your sins are forgiven. And that hope isn't ours just from the past. That kind of hope isn't ours just for today. But that hope is also something that we can hold and grasp and take with us into the future. As you look at the future, it's kind of a scary place sometimes, isn't it? 
You know, we live in a world that is still under the curse of sin, a world in which Satan still prowls and roams, a world in which God's church, someday to be God's church triumphant, is still God's church militant, struggling, being attacked. And yet, no matter how bad things may be in this sick and sinful world, we know, we know that we can look forward to a future with absolute hope and confidence because our, rest, our hope rests in one place, on the powerful word of our God. Our hope draws its strength from one source, from the promises of a gracious God who always keeps his promises. Our hope rests in one person, a Savior who said he would come and he did, a Savior who lived and died for us, and who now says to us he's coming again. And he will, and who leaves us with the promise that he will never leave us or forsake us, that his word will never return to him empty, and that the gates of hell itself will not prevail against his church. What a, what a treasure we have on this day, what it is for us to be thankful for. If these walls could speak, would they not speak of a hope, a hope that we can embrace? David treasured the heritage that God gave him, and he held on to the hope that that heritage brought. But he also said that he and anybody who knew what he knew and who had received what he received would be compelled to do. All you have made will praise you. They will tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all men may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. After this service, go over to the doors of the chapel and take a look at the words that are written above that door. In Greek, the words are kerexa teton oyangelion, preach the gospel. In those three little words, we see exactly what has been taught and proclaimed and has been the life blood and the beating heart of this institution by God's grace for 150 years, the gospel, the good news. And then we're told what needs to be done with that good news. Preach the gospel. Friends, the truth of God's word isn't just something to be protected and defended. It's also something to be proclaimed and shared. If these walls could speak, they would speak about that message a message to be proclaimed and shared wherever and whenever we go. If we are people who stand firmly on God's word, if we are people who hold, hold tightly to the promises he's given us, if we are people who understand what it is, this thing called the unconditional gospel, the unconditional forgiveness that God gives us in Christ, by the way, a message that few people are really preaching these days. If we hold to those things and know that truth, then we will also know that God's gospel, his message, can't remain with us. Like the first disciples, we will be convinced we can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. For 150 years, this seminary, by God's grace, has been equipping and sending people to proclaim and to teach others to proclaim the good news that has been our heritage and our hope. How thankful we can be. How thankful we can be in this grace of God that we haven't deserved, poured out on a little church body like ours, purely by God's grace, purely because of what he's done. If these walls could speak, but they can't. That means you and I have to. That means you and I will speak of a heritage that we treasure and sing about it. That means we will tell of a hope that we embrace. And it means you and I are going to be encouraging one another to proclaim the message that God has placed into our hearts and our hands. That's our heritage. That's our hope. And that's our mission. Amen.
And now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
We rise for prayer. O God of truth and love, always calling us to loftier understanding and deeper wisdom, we seek your will and implore your grace for all who share the life and ministry of Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, knowing that unless you build among us, we will labor in vain. For all the members of God's household and all who are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and all who believe that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, that they may live their lives as witnesses of the gospel and resolve to proclaim it to the ends of the earth. For all the members of our synod who have come to love their Lord Christ and the truth of his revelation, who remember the leaders of our history and honor the heritage of our past, who desire by faith to preserve the purity of the gospel, that they may testify to its truth to every nation, language, tribe, and people. For Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, so richly blessed for so many years, so vital in our fellowship for mission and ministry, so dependent on your guidance and grace, that all who serve and study here may come to rely on the power of your gospel and the surety of your promises as they take your message to the word, world. For the men who teach here, that with a love for your gospel and for all people, they may bring fire and vision to our common task, knowing their own fields, yet eager to relate them to all others, persistent in their academic demands, yet seeing each student as a child of God, prepared to teach not only with great learning, but also in childlike faith. For those who attend to business and finance, who administer activities and encourage gifts of love, that their concern may be not only budgets and buildings, but the men who are roused to serve you and your church. For parents who encourage and support their sons as they study and work, that they may turn their eyes from the struggles and challenges of ministry and come to rejoice in the great tasks and triumphs given to those who preach the eternal gospel. For the students at the seminary and for those at other schools who aspire to be here, who by faith desire to serve but are often unsure of your purpose, and grasp to see the light of their future, that their confusion may be brief, their perspective constantly enlarged, their zeal awakened, and their minds and spirits alert to all that chapel and classroom, library and field work can mean in their lives and ministry. For all those near and far who pray for the seminary, who support the seminary with generous gifts, who encourage the seminary to men who love Jesus and his gospel, that they may hold to the sure hope in your promises, 
rejoice in the certainty of your blessings and live their lives anticipating the great day when all believers will come to share your eternal happiness. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace.
My heart is full, as I'm sure yours is too, to see all this great throng here today, the choirs and chorus of our four ministerial education schools all in one spot, all the school presidents and the president of our synod. What can I say but, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That God should have kept us true to his word for 150 years is certainly something to celebrate and thank him for today. And to know that we are supported by all this vast throng and so many who are watching by streaming video, you can see represented here the thought that it really takes more than a seminary to grow a pastor. It takes an entire synod, hearts joined together by a love for our Savior that encourages gospel heralds from very young on to prepare themselves for the great and good work of saying, your Savior Jesus died for you. And that, of course, is the thing that we are most grateful for today, that for poor sinners like us, we have such a great God and Savior. We have been born into a new and a living hope. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of our God, that stands forever. Thank you so much for joining us in celebration today. God bless you.